Okay, um, so this is uh, lecture nine uh, on ELEC 4076. So we're talking about the scattering parameters and impedance matching. So this is, this will go through two slide presentations, maybe around uh, across three videos, still um, is planned. Now, the first part that we want, I want to talk about is scattering parameters. Now, scattering parameters is a way of characterizing a circuit. Now, the easiest one would be to characterize a two port network. So the two port networks will obviously have two ports, port one, uh, for representation here is shown as port one and that's port two. So we look, try to look at the incident and reflected voltage waves. So the infin, in, incident wave is A1, reflected wave is B1 on the port one. Incident wave on the port two, which we call the output port, is A2 and the reflected wave is B2. Now, if there's a way for us to you know, find out the reflected values B1 and B2, so in terms of A1 and A2 incident values. So the scattering parameter matrix, which sort of characterizes what happens inside here, basically tells you, if you know your scattering parameters this matrix, and if you know your incident signals, you can calculate your reflected signals. The same way, if you know your scattering parameters and your reflective signals, you can calculate your incident signal. So scatter parameters basically is independent. Uh, so it is actually frequency dependent, um, depending for each frequency point, you'll have a certain set of scatter parameters for RF circuit. Now, when you know that, so if you know the reflection coefficients or transmission coefficients, which is defined in here scatter parameters, as long as you know the amplitude of the signals coming in, you can calculate the reflected signals, then you can calculate the power transfers, everything. So that's the beauty of the scattering parameters. And it is, um, so we, we try to, so the, the scattering parameters here will, for a two port networks have two, uh, four terms, S11, S12, S21, S22. Now based on your row number, this is S11, and that's one, two, and one, two. So for a, a matrix, a two port matrix, that's a row number, and that's a column number. So the first element here is S11, the second element here is S12, the third element here is S second row, first column, second row, second column. Now S11, S212, S21, S22 has their certain, like a few certain names. Now S11 is called the input reflection coefficient because it is talking about the incident signal on the port one to the reflected signal on the port one. Now, okay, let's, let's, let's try to uh, simplify this a little bit. Uh, so now from here, if you do the matrix algebra, you can get the first element B1 equals S11 A1 plus S12 A2. Okay, now if in this case, if A2 is zero, that means that signal that comes from the output port to the circuit is zero, that means no amplitude at all. This gets simplified to B1 equals S11 A1. Therefore, S11 can be written as B1 over A1. That means the reflected signal to the incident signal when A2 equals zero. Okay, so we can actually calculate oh, the S11 of a given circuit if you make sure the incident signal on the port two is zero and then we measure the input signal A1 and the reflected signal B1 and then we get the ratio of that and that is the S11 of this circuit. We call this, because it's an input related, it's a port one related, and it's talking about the reflection, we call this input reflection coefficient. So S11 is also called the input reflection coefficient. The same way, if you look at, you can, you can also characterize S12, S21, and S22. 
Now, I won't go into that algebra. I'll just leave it for you guys to figure this out, but it's quite straightforward. Simply, you have to find, like, you know, if you want to make S12, you need to make A1 equals zero. So that's why A1 is zero. And then simply it becomes S12 equals B1 or A2. So this is the reflection on port one, reflection on port one. When there's a signal on port two, input, signal on port two. So likewise, we try to find each of these parameters in a circuit. For a two-port network, we find try to find S11, S12, S21, S22. So basically S, I, and J. Now in this case, I and J, I maximum is two, I max is two, J max is two for a two-port network. So the S11 is called the input reflection coefficient. S12 is called the reverse transmission coefficient. S21 is called the forward transmission coefficient and S22 is the output reflection coefficient. Now, when you think through this, it makes sense why the names were given. S21 basically says from port one to port two, look at the signal. So when you have a port one, A1 input signal, what is the signal that comes out from port two? And that's S1, S21. So the same way is the reverse of that. So when you have a signal on port two, what is the signal that comes out on B1, the port one, if A1 equals zero? Okay, so this is how you can characterize a two port network. Now, when you characterize a circuit or a two port network, you don't need to know what is inside that circuit. That's the beauty of this parameter. So you don't care whether it's a filter, whether it's a you know, amplifier, it doesn't really matter as long as you know this as parameters. Now, this as parameters also is a frequency dependent. So for this, there's a scattering matrix for a frequency one, and there's another scattering matrix for frequency two. So if you think about what you plot on your, on your AWR projects, scattering parameters, uh, so what you are basically plotting is the S11 over frequency. So that shows that, so S11 magnitude, that's what you, so S11 can be a complex number. It's, it is a complex number, obviously. It has a real part and the imaginary part. So I would like you guys to read a bit more on scattering parameters on Steele's book because this, all this contains presented in this uh, two presentations, impedance matching scattering parameters uh, and uh, Smith charts. They're all taken from uh, the STS book and it's a very comprehensive book. I suggest you guys read it and you will have some questions on this in the exam. So make yourself more comfortable with these concepts. Now I'll move on to the impedance matching. Now why impedance matching? Um, now the, basically you can have a circuit that has a certain, so the circuit we call the load or the deliver, deliver the load. This could be, you know, a motor, or this could be, I don't know, antenna. This could be something else. Now you have a voltage source to supply power to this, right? But the voltage source will have its own impedance inside. Impedance is it not, or the source, source impedance. That impedance is not as long as that impedance is different to this load impedance, you won't have the maximum power transfer because you don't want, you basically your objective is to do maximum power transfer. So if you want to do maximum power transfer, if you remember from your basic electronics theory courses, you will have, you had a requirement called for a maximum power transfer, you need to have the source impedance equal to the, so you need to have the load impedance equal to the source equivalent, which is RL equals RS. So in that times, we were not talking about frequency dependent RF circuits, we're talking about basically DC circuits. So you had a plus minus voltage source and the source had a resistance of RS and then you have a RL load then if your RS equals RL, you get the maximum voltage. You get pretty much V over two here because that's two equal voltages. And then your V squared 
over r is your total power so your maximum power is v squared over 4 r load and that's the p max that you can do so the condition was rs equals to rl now if you had a different rs to rl you won't get the maximum power trap so same way your intention is your impedance of the source to match the impedance of the load now the difference in this course is that these loads are not just in pure 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 resistances they can be they are impedances they can have a real part and an imaginary part so the real part of the load is a resistance load resistance and the reactance so you need to make sure that your load matches your impedance of sorry your source matches the impedance of your load so once you do that you can have a maximum power transfer now how do you make sure that you need to create a matching circuit in between similar to that so matching circuit will transform this impedance to an impedance here that load prefers to have the maximum power transfer for example the theory is that when you transfer this z node to here looking at the load looking at the source side you should see z load conjugate and if you see z load conjugate looking towards the source if the load sees the conjugate of the impedance of the load then you can get the maximum power transfer now why is that because say the z load the load in uh, impedance equals r l plus j x l right so that's the real part and that's the imaginary part now say that we have to match the resistances so from your basic theory you know that your source resistance has to be the equal to the load resistance now the condition is in this interface here it's rl plus j xl now if you have something called rl minus j xl looking at this side that's looking at towards the source the source is here what happens the, when these add up in a series minus jxl cancels with jxl so you have so this negative reactance can cancel the reactance of the load and then you have the source resistance and the load resistance so looking from here the resistance this circuit will see is only the real part here this way real part and if they are equal they can do the maximum power transfer now if that's the case the condition is that that is it the conjugate so looking at the source side the load should see load is it load conjugate right so the matching network if you if your intention is to transfer the maximum power you should make sure the z naught when it comes here is z naught equals z load conjugate. Um, so not z naught here. I'm saying z naught looking into here. So maybe let's say the impedance here is z one, and then z one should be z load conjugate. So the matching ne networks obviously improves the signal to noise ratio because you get more signal through. And the matching network also only possible when real then when there's a real part in the load because if you don't have a real part if it's purely imaginary it's a reactive load so you can't get a maximum power transfer because you can't that means your source impedance has to be zero too right so you can only do have a matching network when you have a impedance when you have a real impedance in the load now there are different types of uh, matching networks so start with the lambda element matching so the lambda element matching is very well preferred for the lower frequencies so it's pre pretty much the you know the inductors and then the capacitors that you see so the lambda element matching now they are preferred in the lower frequencies up to a certain gigahertz so even if your handsets will have the lambda elements now the disadvantages or oh, basically let's talk about the advantages of lambda element matching they are comparatively smaller in size now compared to its counterpart distributed elements distributed elements are basically your microstrip line elements 
So that means transmission line components. So for an inductor, you might have a spiral then, like that. And then for a capacitor, you have a two plate capacitor. No, that's actually the proper capacitor, but you may have a capacitor like a stump, micro strip line stump. stump. Now, the disadvantage of using distributed elements at lower frequencies is that they tend to be bigger in size for lower frequencies. If you remember our previous discussions from the lectures, we talked about this, um, you know, we compared to wavelengths at lower frequencies, distributed elements tends to be much significantly bigger in size. So it's difficult to use the distributed element matching at lower frequencies, so we tend to use lambda element. But the lambda elements can be, you know, in terms of disadvantages for lambda elements can be lossy at higher frequencies and their inductive and capacitive effects come into play. For a distributed elements, now at a higher frequency is more preferred because they are low loss C because, and the size wise, they are comparable and they can be implemented in your circuits. Now, even if you in your projects that you using in KU band or KA band, it's much preferred to use distributed elements. Now, distributed elements are the advantages, they can handle high power. Uh, the, so if we use, if you want to have a high power application at lower frequencies, we tend to use distributed elements regardless of the size uh, disadvantage. Now, other than that, that you tend to sometimes use hybrid techniques where you can, you know, have a lambda and a distributed mix and ad hoc matching networks methods as well. Um, so I suggest you guys to read about different types of matching networks again in uh, Steve's book or some other books as well. So before we go into impedance machine, we would also like to talk a little bit on uh, Q factor. So this might be a term that you may have, have heard in previous courses, but uh, basically Q factor, or also known as quality factor, basically tells you, um, so it, it is, a way of characterizing a loss of lambda inductors and capacitors because each inductor will have a certain level of loss because of the series resistance. Now, for example, uh, here you have an inductor, but ideal inductors will not have a resistance. So, but in real life, you have a resistance. Because of the resistance, you have a certain loss. Uh, because of that, you need to if you want to compare different inductors you need to get an idea like how do they compare to each other so you trend to look at you know the q value of those inductors now q value is basically two pi times the maximum energy stored in the inductor versus the energy lost in this inductor now for for if, if for an inductor so q inductor would be omega oil or R. So the inductors, inductance in a inductor will store the energy and resistance will actually dissipate the energy. So it's the, that's the lost. So omega is basically two pi F for frequency. So this is the Q of an inductor. Now, similarly for a capacitor, we can also define a Q factor and it is given by QC over G. Now, G is the conductance and C is the capacitance. Each capacitor will have a conductance associated with it, with it between the plates and the, because of the dielectric material used in there. Now, as a result, that will also be lossy. Now, you also notice the Q, depending, so if R is quite smaller for inductor, say it tends to go to zero, you can imagine the Q factor will actually rise if the other factors are constant. So the Q can be quite high for a very low loss inductor. You'll also notice the Q value of an inductor is also dependent on omega, that is the frequency of U. So as you increase your, so it's, it's, it's basically um, a varying value 
depending on your frequency. However, for a capacitor, it is not really a varying value. It's almost constant, the Q factor, because with omega, G changes as well. The conductance is also increasing with the frequency. So they tend to cancel out the effect. So the Q of a capacitor is almost constant, but for an inductor, it is very frequency dependent. Now, we were trying to basically look at the loss of an inductor, but Q also refers in a way translate to a bandwidth. Now, the bandwidth, now for example, this is the, say this is the maximum power that is transferred through a circuit. Now, we, we define a circuit Q value, the quality factor of that circuit as, so if you have at a particular frequency, you have maximum power and you look at the minus three dB values on the left hand, right? And we define your bandwidth of this is the maximum power transfer that you can have. And that also can, so that delta F is your bandwidth from here to here. And FR is basically in this case, F naught is the resonance frequency. So you notice that Q is defined as FR, the resonance frequency divided by the bandwidth. So if you have a smaller bandwidth, you tend to have a higher Q. So if you have low loss, inductors in circuits and then you tend to have higher Q. So that means your purely imaginary, purely actually are the, the most ideal inductors have tend to be very low um, lossy and they tend to be less bandwidth as well. So that's uh, just an insight because we will be using this Q factor in the next couple of slides. So maybe in the, when we try to match uh, come up with a circuit, uh, uh, impedance matching circuit. Okay, now, now what I'm going to explain now is we're trying to build up a methodology to uh, create impedance matching networks. We're trying to build the L network, but it might not be apparent until it comes to the next uh, two, three slides, what we're trying to do, but we are basically trying to transform a re series resistors impede uh, reactance to an equivalent parallel conductance and susceptance, G and B. Now, why we need it? It will become apparent in the next couple of slides. Basically, the just to give you a brief overview, we are trying to, um, so you can have a source, I'm gonna write here. You can have a source, every source will, so this is a DC, but let's say this is an um, uh, RF source, will have its own resistance and a reactance to it. So when you look at the small signal models, if you remember the DC components we can short, so this part is at the moment, let's think about that as a source resistance and the uh, reactance. Now, as I said before, the load will also have its own resistance of the load and its own reactance, right? So we want to make sure at the interface, the load when looking into the source side, C, so let's say this is a Z load. From this side, it sees Z load conjugate. So basically that's why we are transferring, well, transforming this impedance to a Z load. So in, impedance that you see here from this interface, which is RS plus XS, you need to transform that to Z load. So I'm gonna write it back. So now RS, I can write, RS, and that's the source. And then you have a impedance matching circuit. And then you have the load, which has a XL, RL. So looking here, it says, is it load? Now at this interface, if it can see, is it load conjugate? the imaginary parts cancels out. So the, part, the function of the impedance matching circuit is basically transform this is an input, which is RS plus XX 
two, he said load conjugate, which is, so Rs plus X J X S should be transformed into RL minus J X L out of, out from this impedance value second. So that's the intention. Now, before we go into that in detail, we need to do some basic, you know, um, we need to come up with basic uh, understanding on, on a few things that we want to do. If we could go into that. So I'm gonna, um, um, take you through uh, some basic steps first. Now this is a simple way of transferring. Uh, so when we do this algebra, we will have to occasionally transform, actually uh, frequently transform. Sometimes the series resistance and the reactance to series uh, parallel conductance and susceptances. For example, now this circuit can be equivalent to represented by a series circuit can be equivalent represented by a parallel circuit here. And if you want to do that, we need to map G, we need to map, we need to map R and XS to G and B. So that's what we are doing. So our final result of G can be represented by R over R squared plus X squared and B can be minus X over R squared plus X squared. Now we'll just go through that. Uh, just try to derive that. For example, now we want to look, so the impedance looking at here, looking into here is heading is a frequency dependent impedance can be written as Rs plus J XS. Now, if this is the equivalent circuit, the Y in Omega, that's the admittance looking into here, can be one over Z in Omega because it's the same circuit. This part of my uh, display doesn't work, so I have to write it over here. Z in Omega, um, sorry, Y in Omega, is one over Z in omega. Now Y in is actually G plus JB. That's that's the admittance of that. Admittance of that they add in series because they admittances. So Z in omega means RS plus JXS. If I want to you know, remove the imaginary terms at the bottom, I have to multiply this. Jxs over Rs minus Jxs. So at the bottom I get Rs squared minus J squared X squared top Rs minus Jxs. Now J squared is minus one because of that minus cancels out. So you get Rs minus Jxs over Rs squared plus X squared. Uh, you can write, rewrite this, rearrange it, Rs over Rs squared plus minus Xs over Rs squared plus times J. So G plus JB, that means G is is pretty much the real part of it, which is G. And that's what is shown here, same thing. And that part is your B. So we are pretty much mapping the series resistance and the reactors to a parallel conductors and a susceptance. So that's just a transformation that I've shown here before. So we can transform them like that. Now you also notice if you look at the, so if we, what if we represent, so this is a conductance. So any conductance is the reciprocal of the resistance of here. So if you have a resistance here, RP, we can say it's one over G, right? So that means G is RS squared plus XS squared over RS. And you'll notice that so the RS here, when I said RS is pretty much 
that I notice it as RS. This is greater than RS because if you take RS plus excess over RS squared, so it's always greater than RS. So when you transform that G, the conductance or the inverse of G, the resistance of that load in a parallel circuit, the R parallel here, is always greater than the resistance that, was, that you had originally. So that's something you need to remember. So this RP is greater than, so R parallel is greater than the resistance, original resistance. Okay, but similarly, you can also transform a parallel resistance and then uh, susceptance to a series resistance and reactance. Now, I won't go into detail. I would actually want you guys to do it because it's a similar uh, technique to show how it's done. But at the end of the day, you will end up with RS, this the series resistance based on the original resistor and the susceptance values. Your series resistance is shown as R over one plus B squared R squared. And the series reactance in terms of the original R and B values is given by that. But what you should notice is the series resistance here is smaller than the original resistance because this term is larger than R. So because of that, Uh, the series resistance is smaller than the, the original resistance. Now, how does this help us? Uh, so what we are trying to do, for example, if you have a series resistance, so for example, there's a source, then you have series resistance and the series reactance. And then, then you have a load which has a series load and then Excel. For, for, for at this stage, we ignore the load, just say the load is pure resistive. Now, if I want to transform, I want to have an impedance matching network in between. So what I'm trying to do is transform this. So looking at here, is it load? Looking this way, is it load should be conjugate to be the best, you know? So for example, in this, this setup, if it's hard for me to do that because, um, so I, 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 I have a reactive component. So I, I just don't, I just want to get it, get rid of that. Now, what if I can, cancel this reactance. So what happens if I transform this to a parallel circuit? Let's look at that. When I transform this to a parallel circuit, I will get a RP value, equivalent RP value, or G value. And then I also will get some sort of a conductance value, G. Right? Now, if I can have another circuit the so the, if this is say this is a capacitor, we can have an inductor to cancel out this reactive component and say that R load and RP, if they are equal, say RP equals RL, then you can get the maximum power transfer. So I'm gonna repeat this again. I'll probably write it a bit more clearly. So to get it, um, because this is very important, this part understanding the concept. So you have a source, voltage source, and that will have its own R source. And then it has excess. And then looking in here, that's the input impedance or the source impedance. Then we have a matching circuit. Then this side we have um, load impedance 
and the reactive part of it here z load so to maximum power transfer looking into the source it has to be z load conjugate so whatever this matching circuit what it presents should be rl minus jxl so that cancels out with the rl plus jxl this part and this part cancels out so you get the maximum power transfer so that means looking in here the impedance that this should see should be equivalent to the resistance of the load so if we convert this to a parallel circuit we will get a resistance say for example rp and a g sorry not b and then we can have some sort of circuitry in here so that cancels out all the reactive parts and the rp is equal to rl in this case let's say if rp equals to rl then you can you satisfy that condition to have the maximum power transfer but you know that rs is not equal to rp but rs somehow relates to rp based on the previous equations that we went through same way if, um, you can also have parallel resistive and the conductive um, sorry parallel resist uh, parallel resistor and the susceptance and then you can transform that to series resistor and the reactance depending on what your matching circuit looks like and then you can map them so that your reactive parts cancels out and your source transformation source impedance transformation turns out to be the same as the load and then you get the maximum power transfer so matching is a two-step process step one is so you use a series so ignoring what is in the brackets use a series reactive element to transform to a smaller resistance so what it basically said was if you had a resistor and a series reactive element it transform into a into a load parallel and rp is always greater than r source so if you use a series reactive element you can transform this impedance of the source to a much bigger impedance because if your load say is a larger impedance or larger resistance you can then match that load resistance and the source transform resistance so if you want to make it bigger you have a series uh, series reactive element if you want to make it smaller you have a you have a shunt reactive element as the other other case r source and then you have add a shunt reactive elements and then your r series when it transform the series resistance would be smaller than your original source resistance so that's the first part that you do then you use a shunt reactive element to resonate with or cancel the imaginary part of the impedance that results from step one so because when you transfer transfer this to a parallel circuit like that for example if you transfer that r source and the x source to a parallel circuit you can have rp and then you end up with something like b and your load will have rl and now what you know is that rp you, you sort of did the transformation so that rp equals rl but you don't want this b you just want to cancel that b with the negative b element so that cancels out so you presented impedance from the source is equal to presented impedance of the load so that's the whole, whole step now these things will get more clear when you actually do more sample questions i think because it's it's difficult to understand as like a, if, if this is the first time that you are listening to this that might be you know be a bit uh, challenging okay now now so, so the same way that we you know we, we don't want to go through all that steps every time so we come up with some certain design equations
So what we are trying to get is we divide this into two segments. This is the source part and that's the load part. Okay. Okay. Now I want to look at the impedance looking into the load. So impedance looking into the load is pretty much given by because so these are two parallel circuits one reactance and the resistance it's given by this formula so it's you can add the ad, admittances so basically plus So when you do that, it becomes RL JXL over RL plus JXL. And then you can do the algebra and then get it the real part and the imaginary part. So you get these. Now the same way, so, so basically what we are trying to do is looking into to this side, we found input impedance of the load. That's what we get, okay? So let's look at here, looking into here, we can see that it is Rs plus Jxs. We came to the area of the screen. So looking into here this way, it is Rs plus Jxs. Now what you want is that input impedance. Now what you want is you're looking into here, you, what you present out from this point, you want to get the conjugate, complex conjugate of the source. So let's say for this circuit, we present the complex conjugate. That's what we want to do. So what we, we are trying to provide, looking into here, the circuit, whatever the circuit will present RS minus j excess which is also equal to z input so simply we have this is rs this is minus j excess so your rs would be rl xl squared plus rl squared plus x squared which is this one your excess would be minus because it's minus excess is this term so excess would be that term so if you had the source if you pick if you pick the source impedance in a series resistor, a source to be so because if you know your resistance of the load and the reactance of that load you can pick or you can transform your impedance of the source to this value and the reactance to this value so that they actually when you're looking from here looking at the load you will see the opposite or conjugate of the load impedance and they cancels out each other. Now from here we can do some algebraic manipulations but then you tend to basically you divide these two together excess divided by RS and then you get this then from there you can also work out RS or RL the value. Now we, at this point we define two parameters uh, the Q which you talked about before for a series leg, it is the reactance divided by the resistance. For a parallel leg or shunt leg, it's the resistance divided by the reactance. Now, based on that, we can work out this formula. These formulas, I think I, you should also look at the Steers book, how this is right, or you can work it out by yourself. It's quite simple because Q, QS pretty much is the magnitude magnitude Q is pretty much the magnitudes, they are equal because then QS and QP is equal. And then from doing this uh, RL, RS, you can sub in the RL over XL, which is QP here, and then you can work out, you, you end up with this equation. So if you, if you want to quickly do that, 
just for clarity here, so RL of XL is QP, right? So you can sub in here. RS of RL equals one over QP squared plus one. And then from here, QP squared plus one is RL of RS. And then QP squared is R L over RS minus one. And then you get the square root, so you get QP. And QP magnitude is same as QS magnitude. Now, while you're doing that, it will become apparent in a while. So the same way we did that, we can work out, you know, in generally few equations. Now, if this is the load, so basically what we are trying to do is, we're trying to find out a matching circuit when you know the source impedance and the load impedance. Now, for in this case, we treat load impedance as purely resistive source impedance as PL resistive. So based on the values, we this is the matching networks that we can pick. Now there are four types of matching networks. These are called L-type matching networks. They are very narrow band, but that's okay as a start. There's a few design formulas that you can use. Now you notice there's a few conditions that you have to satisfy. These two conditions is when source resistance is smaller than the load resistance, which relates to our very first transformation where we did the series where we had a RS and a XS, and then we transformed them to a parallel RP and a B value. So we, we also noticed that the RP was greater than RS. The same thing it's saying the load here is larger than, so these two, goes in hand to hand, but the matching network is slightly different. Here they have a capacitor, inductor, they have a capacitor here. Okay, so what is the benefit of having an inductor versus a capacitor? Now here you notice that it says low pass and here it's high pass. If you have an inductor, the DC will flow through. There's nothing to block DC, but at higher frequencies because inductor Impedance is given by JXL, which is which is also J omega L. At higher frequency, as the frequency goes up, this term gets higher, bigger. And at high frequencies, this tend to be a stop, this tend to stop higher frequencies. So it is a low pass filter somewhat. So it's called the low pass RSO. And this one is DC block. At low frequencies, you can't have, you know, DC signal going through the capacitor, but higher frequencies, the capacitor becomes short. So that's a high pass. Now this is when the load impedance is larger than the source impedance. Now same way when the load impedance is, load resistance is smaller than source resistance, we have two more design equations. So we'll do one question and that will get things more clear. So that has certain, you know, calculations. So let's do one question and then try to make sense. So it says design a circuit to match 100 ohm source to a 1700 ohm load. Okay, so the, the resistance of the source and the load is purely resistive, a purely real. Um, so we have a source, I'm kind of trying to relate the source and the load, right? So we have a source which is 100 ohm, which is RS. And then we have a load that is 1700 ohm. And then we need a certain matching circuit in between to have the impedance. Now, what are the conditions here? Is RL greater than RS? Yes. So we have two options. RL greater than RS, this is right. This We can use that or we can use that. We can't use this, we can't use this because they are, they are in that case, RL is smaller than RS. RL is smaller than RS. So we can only use either this or either this. Let's look at the question again. Assume that a DC voltage must also be transferred from the source to the load. That means there should be a DC voltage that goes through that. So if you want the DC voltages to go through, that means it has to be an inductor. You can't have this circuit because the capacitor will block DC. So you basically come down to selecting, select this circuit. So your circuit will look like, looking at this, 
a series inductor and a parallel capacitor. So you will have a series inductor and a parallel capacitor like this pretty much. So you have L and C value here. Okay, now it's time to use the design equations. So the design equation says Q is RL over RS minus one. Okay, so I have to find the Q which is RL over RS minus one. So RL is 1700. RS is 100 minus 1, so that's 17 minus 1, 16, and Q value of this circuit is 4. Now this Q value is, we can, if you know the Q value, you can use the second design equation, which is that one, this part, to find XL and XC. Okay, let's try to find XL. Now what is XL is pretty much J omega L. So we don't want the J because this is talking about the design equation is talking about only in terms of magnitudes. So the first one gives you Q equals magnitude of XL divided by RS. Now Q is known, so Q is four. XL is omega L, which is two pi, the frequency 900 megahertz, 900, 10 to the power nine, inductor value, which we don't know this value. So we're going to find that, divide by resistance of the source, which is 100. Now, it's pretty much simple algebra afterwards. So when you calculate L, you get 400 divided by two pi, divided by 900 times 10 to the power nine. And this will turn out to be somewhere about 7.07, .07, 10 to the power minus eight Henry, because this is on all the, that means it's 70.7 .7 nano Henry. So you want a circuit with an inductor here, 70.7 .7 nano Henry. So we found that inductor value. Let's find the capacitor value. So we use this, is an equation. So that this is also equal to RL over XC. So Q equals RL over XC magnitude. Now for a capacitor, XC is one over omega C. That means if you sub in that value here, you have Q equals RL one over omega C. So that means one over omega C comes up. So omega C equals Q over RL. C equals Q divided by RL divided by omega. Now from here, C equals Q is four. Load is 1700 resistance times omega is two pi times 10 to the power nine times 900, sorry, uh, omega is 10 to the power six. I think I did something wrong here. It's megahertz, it's 10 to the power six. 10 to the power six. So the, you'll get an answer somewhere around 0.416 picofarad. So the capacitor, then what you need is 0.416 picofarad. So it's, it's not that hard to find it. So basically you found the matching circuit. So you have a source, 100 ohm, then you have inductor, capacitor, and then you have the load resistance of 1700. And that's 0 0.416, and that's 70.7 .7 nano Henry, and that's picofarad. So if you have this circuit, you should be able to match, you know, transfer your maximum power to this. Uh, we can also check this from a, you know, simple, just verify this from AWR project. What I would like to do is create a schematic. It's easy to do that from AWR and then add, uh, go to elements, Lambda elements, resistor, 
So our source resistors was 100. And then I have the load resistance, 1700. So if I look at, if I look at S11 for this circuit, Okay, now I have to look at, at 900 megahertz, so obviously I have to define frequencies. Project options go to here, I will do you know, 0 0.0123, yeah, apply, so I get, but then I also need to read this, so I have to add a graph, add new graph, and then I have to add a graph, so I add a graph, add a new graph, um, rectangular graph is fine, I want to add measurement, what parameter is parameter, Circuit schematic one. I'm looking at S11, it's in DB. Okay. Now, if I have the schematic connected, oh, this has to be grounded. I will come here. So I have minus four, minus 0.48. Obviously, that means it's not, it's reflecting almost all the power. Um, so let's go to project top properties. Sorry, not here. Graph options. Left axis, I will do minimum minus 50, maximum you know, five. So you notice that we would like to you know, have us at 900 megahertz at, so where's 900? I got somewhere here, right? Yeah. line marker point nine. So we want something, you know, to it to match around this frequency. So when we put our matching circuit that we sort of found before, that means I replace this with the inductor and a capacitor as a matching circuit. I had inductors values of. 70.7 then I had a capacitor value of 0 0.416 picofarad and then this capacitor is also grounded and then let's try that so you notice that it's actually trying to match it, right? So that at that frequency, it has very many. I mean, it's not obviously perfect, but it's doing. It's it's getting better. So it theory works, and it. So the bandwidth wise, you notice that's not that wide band. It's only you know it covers a certain frequency band a little bit. But that's that's basically we derive these values theoretically calculating, and that's how we use the design formulas. I think that will make it clear um, for you guys, like how to use this and formula. Now, for example, if the same, uh, if you had to, you know, give this the other way, 1700 here and 100 here, you, you'll have to pick what design equation to use you will have one of these circuits picked, either this or that. Depending on how they say, if they want it to be, you know, DC pass, you will pick this design equation because in this case, RS is greater than RL. And then you want the DC to pass. Okay, obviously you pick pick this. You first calculate your first step, calculate your Q. Then second step, you based on that Q, you find your XL. And that means you find your L. Then you find your XC, that means you find your C. So simply you have a matching circuit defined pretty much for your circuit. Okay, so that's all we want to talk today. Uh, and, uh, and I'll talk about a little bit more on matching in the next video, but I think that should be enough for today, thanks.